morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Uh, my name is Franz Van Rooyen. Uh, I'm the infrastructure architect for Adobe. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about a multi, multi cloud project we've been doing at Adobe to get run, Mesos running in multiple clouds. Um, first off, I'd like just to start with saying thank you to the Linux Foundation for hosting this event. Um, it's, a, it's great to be here. Um, great to be able to share this with you guys. Um, second is thanks to Adobe for actually letting me come, um, get my head out of the get my head out of the screen and be able to come travel to this gorgeous country, uh, see the sights, but most importantly present to you guys. Thank you. Um, also, want to uh, say thank you to you. Uh, thanks you guys for being here, being interested in the technology, being wanting to learn more about it. I'm excited to present this to you. I hope that you get some value out of it. Quickly, just want to go through the agenda here. Um, first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we were trying to solve as far as the problem goes. Often as technologists, we go out and we see a cool technology out there, we run and start implementing it because it's cool, but we fail to actually understand the problem we're wanting to solve. For me as an architect, it's actually pretty critical that I understand that problem because not just do I have to understand the technology, I also have to relay to the managers and everybody upstairs from me why we're doing this, right? And if I tell them, oh, we're using Mesos because it's cool, that just doesn't go very far. So we need to have a reason why we're doing it. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. After that, we're gonna talk about how DCOS actually helps us achieve solving this problem. And yes, not Mesos, but DCOS. And um, the, the fact that uh, some of the pieces that we use out of there. Um, third, we're going to kind of talk, then dive into the actual multi-cloud design, how we actually design this and we're running this on multi-clouds. We'll go piece by piece and kind of walk through all of the pieces in there. And then kind of talk about what else I should know. And what, what this is, is really just providing you guys the resources you need to be able to go and read this about yourself. Everything we've done here, there's nothing proprietary, there's nothing secret, it's just everything is out there and open and available to you. So I want to share this with you, and you can do a much better job than we ever did. So, so first off, kind of talk about how, what, what is the problem we wanted to solve. So Adobe is a software company, as I'm sure some of you know, um, and we have a lot of engineers who create software. Part of that is, um, you know, the challenge of creating software at a large scale distributed system is actually quite challenging. And so trying to do this right across environments has been a challenge. So when we, uh, when we hire an engineer, usually fresh from school or university, this is how they look at the world, right? They have some idea, they're gonna enhance the service, they're gonna build a service, they're gonna do something cool that's gonna be great for the company. They go to their laptop, they write the code, they use some common pieces in there, um, uh, open source most probably, and then we start making money. So in their mind, this is really what's happening, is I go in, I do my idea, I write it on my laptop, and I deploy it, and we start making money. Closer? Is that better? Sorry, you guys. Um, so, however, an engineer soon finds out that reality looks like this. He has his, he has his idea, right? He's gonna implement this, and process happens. It's just a lot of things that he has to go through to get that code out in production. He has to understand what the QE systems looks like. He has to understand what the infrastructure looks like. On top of that, add something else, add something else, which is multi-cloud, and now he has to understand the different services in the different clouds, right? With AWS, with Azure, all of these come from different services. With the data center, it functions very differently. There's, very new, there's a lot of nuances an engineer that never wanted to understand or do this now has to understand to get that code out there. And by the time he finally gets the code out there, it's gone the way of the typewriter, right? His code is really not relevant anymore. So he's done this, all this work, he's gotten excited about this, but he had to go through so much process that by the time he got it out, it was just not relevant. So this is the fundamental problem of what we wanted to solve. So this is the technologies. The technology is one of the core technologies that we use. This is actually Mesos. 
and we did it on multiple clouds. So how does DCOS help our case here? How does DCOS or Mesos, which is a subcomponent, as Aaron was talking about earlier, um, of uh, Mesos is a subcomponent of DCOS, how does this all help us? Okay, so we created what we call the Adobe Multi-Cloud Stack. And this is a team that we're working on, and um, we figured this is the problem we wanted to solve, and this is how we're gonna solve it. Once again, we have our developer. <clears throat> We have our developer, and he's writing code. But instead of being concerned with all the nuances of clouds and everything else, he only should be concerned with the tools he knows best, right? So Git, to be able to source control his code. Um, Jenkins, to be able to build his code. And a spec file. So these are all standard things that he just has to worry about, and that's all he needs to worry about, to get his code all the way out in production. So now you're wondering, and you're sitting there and saying, hey, okay, I know Git, and I know Jenkins, but what's the spec file there? That's not something standard, I don't know anything about that. Well, the engineer just has to tell us, hey, I'm writing some software, I want this much resources, and I want to run it over here. And instead of submitting a Jira ticket to do that, or calling somebody, or working, or having multiple meetings to do that, you can now just put it in a file that actually gets wrapped in the build system. Once that happens, this amazing thing that we can now do using the build system is wrap that code in a container, right? So the cool thing about this is, is that with container technology, we're able now to take code from a laptop, from something that was written on the, on the, engineer's, on the engineer's own workstation, and deploy that and move it across different systems. In the past, that used to be very difficult. You were dealing with the engineer writes it on his laptop, it moves to QE, and it doesn't work in QE for some reason, right? Libraries are out of sync in different versions. It moves from QE to production, it doesn't work in production for some reason, same reasons, right? You have to maintain all of these systems, and it have to be static systems that is very, very standardized, very hard to do. Along came container technology and kind of changed that for us. We are now able to run a container and no matter what system it runs on, it always runs the same. So the excuse of, hey, it worked on my machine, no longer is relevant. Okay. So there we have the platform, right? So we now have the system that was built, code that was built, it was wrapped in a container, the spec file was put around it, and then deployed into a platform. That platform's running BCOS, and all of these systems you can guys can see there, there's a dev cluster, a QE cluster, and a production cluster, all will run that same container. That container will just be promoted through the system. Okay? So it hits dev, it checks through it, it's promoted to QE, it checks through it, it's production. Well, now that container runs there and it registers itself with some kind of like self-discovery component. In DCOS, there's actually a component you can use called Marathon LB. Um, for our system, we used Nginx, it doesn't really matter. Some kind of load balancing component where you can update the configuration automatically so you can actually do service discovery. Say, hey, I have a container ready, I'm ready to access, and I'm ready for the consumer to come into me. This is great. If you look at this, this is actually really awesome. It's very simple, it's very standardized. It enables the developer to build code on his own machine, to deploy that code to developer, QE in production, and then have consumers be able to access that without anyone being involved. There's no Jira tickets, there's no people coming in saying, I have to, DC Ops coming in saying, I have to plug this in before you can have your machine, and so forth. This is just all the way through. So we went up and discussed this and said, okay, this is what we propose building. And everybody was excited, and management said, yes, go, go build this. This is exactly what we need. Cool, do it. Docker is awesome, Mesos is awesome, DCOS is awesome, go do this. And so we went to Ops, right, our operations component, and said, okay, let's build this. Architecture shade to Ops, let's build this. And Ops said, that's great. What about the infrastructure? And we're like, hey, what about the infrastructure? We went to management and they're like, no, no, this is the cloud. You're gonna run this in the cloud. There's no infrastructure, it just runs, right? It's just the cloud. No, the cloud is just somebody else's machine, right? So there's still infrastructure. It's still infrastructure to be concerned about. So we had to think about how are we going to run these clusters 
abstracted by the multiple clouds. And as you can see, we're running it on AWS, we're running on Azure, and we're running in private. Now we'll all skip between pulling a private cloud or data center. Same thing for us then. One main component here, uh, operating system is the same, right? Running CoreOS. So as you look right there, you saw we're running it all with these clouds, and you might have thought, but why are you doing that? Why are you running this thing on multiple clouds? Why not just run this in the data center? Or why not just run this in AWS or Azure? Just make up your mind, run it in there and pull it good and be done with it. Why introduce this complexity of multiple clouds? And this is actually a question that a lot of people have been debating over, including us internally, and operations and engineering has an interesting way of doing it. If you ask an engineer why he's doing it in AWS, he's gonna tell you, it's agile, I don't have to create tickets, and I have infrastructure as code, so I can actually pull the infrastructure programmatically and build it. That's what I like, I wanna do it that way. If you go ask, oops, why, the, on the data center, they're going to say it's secure, it's cheaper, and we have more control. So what ended up happening is very much like this, right? It's very much like this fencing thing, where OPS goes up a little bit and fences and says, hey, if you do this in the data center, it's going to be more secure and cheaper. And engineering comes along and says, hey, if we do it in AWS, it's going to be faster, or in Azure, or whatever public cloud uh, the flavor of the day is. And so sometimes all wins, and the service goes out to the uh, private data center. Sometimes engineering wins, and the service goes out to the public cloud. But never a consistent way of deploying infrastructure to which cloud. We just don't have that story right. And you can see I labeled up there, that's the past. Because thanks to Mesos, thanks to DCOS, we can make that story a lot easier now, right? If we run clusters, that's abstracted out of the infrastructure, like I showed. Nobody really cares about the infrastructure, except if you're an operator. Then suddenly, all you care about is, where do I really need to run my stuff to run most effectively? And the two main things that comes up is latency and data governance. So if you're thinking about, where do I need to run my stuff, right? Where do I need to run my container as an engineer? In my spec file, I can say, it's very late and sensitive. I need to be, it needs to be in a location over in um, Europe. Because of that, operations now can take that requirement and run that in the appropriate cloud. There's no more of this fencing, there's no more of this debate going on. This is very standardized, very standardized questions. Operations and engineering doesn't battle, engineering doesn't care, because they know their container's gonna go and run where it needs to run most. That's why multiple clouds make sense, right? We don't have data centers in every location, so we need to use public cloud to get that latency required or that data governance requirement, right? What I mean by data governance is certain countries wants the data to stay in that country. Um, we also don't always have those requirements on the application. The application can run anywhere, and so data center is actually a good choice. Data center is cheaper, we can do a lot more with data center, so run it in the data center, we can scale it out to the cloud, of public cloud if we need to. So at this point, it really becomes irrelevant as far as oh, OPS, OPS's way or infrastructure's way or engineering's way. It's all about where latency and data governance is at, and we can establish those pieces in there very fast. Okay, now to dig in a little bit. We've kind of talked about what is the problem that we're trying to solve. We've talked a little bit about this multi-cloud approach and why we've taken a multi-cloud approach, right? So now we're talking about some of the stuff we can actually do right out of the box with the COS in multiple clouds. So as we, as we started our journey and started building this platform um, that we wanted to do um, in multiple clouds, we actually started looking towards the COS immediately. So we already were running numerous Mesos clusters. We were already very familiar with it, but we were only running them in very specific locations. We were looking at providing this more of a service to the internal company. And so we were looking at DCOS um, simply because it's very easy to install, as Aaron mentioned here before, um, and it's, it's pretty standardized. And the nice thing about DCOS is if you download it, it actually comes with pre-cloud installers. It comes with CloudFormation template for AWS, 
So you can actually just go run the template in AWS and it'll build out you a single node cluster for developer, or it'll build out a multi-node cluster for production. It also comes with a ARM template for Azure. So you can actually go spin it out in Azure as well, same, same, same way. However, as we started digging in, one of the key tenants that we've had is being able to be standardized and being able to be simple. And DCOS is still a very young project. There's still things that needs to be worked on, and we're trying to contribute to that as well. However, for what we wanted to do, um, there's just a couple of things that we couldn't do with the templates they provided us. So, for example, on AWS, they spin up clusters using CoreOS. On Azure, they spin up clusters using Ubuntu. Um, that difference gets away from our standardization rule for infrastructure, and so now we have to go make a change and move the, AWS or the Azure one to CoreOS. A couple of the other things that we need to do as well is we would like to, for production, in, inject a security rules in here, a security policy, um, our own, our own um, uh, IDM solution and authentication pieces. And it makes it very hard to actually do that in here because what you're getting is JSON files, right? You're actually getting those are two JSON files in the back that actually have run. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't, I'm not too fond about writing or modifying JSON files of two or three thousand lines of code and mucking around with it for days and trying to figure out why, why I forgot a space somewhere or something like that. So we decide to actually look through and build out what we call multi-cloud design. How are we going to approach the clouds, the multiple clouds, and have these tenant pieces in place? Simplicity, to be able to do it very simple, and being able to do it very standard, standardized. So this is what the logical, in, uh, the logical design looks like. First off, we have something we call input data. So input data is just simply the ability the data we need to hand to the system that's going to build the cloud, right? The cluster in the cloud. This data can either be, it can be as simple as a file. So it can just be a text file if you want, and you don't have much. Or it can be a core as complex as a CMDB. In our case, we're actually using a CMDB. Um, we're able to get dynamic data out of there, generate the file automatically, and then be able to submit it up to be able to be built out. But what this is, is just standard data that needs to go in so the cloud knows, or the, the cluster knows, how to set itself up. This is data like instance sizes, right? What kind of instances am I going to use? It's also data like um, where, where I need to run my infrastructure, things like that. Second part is the infrastructure data. Um, what we mean here is, what kind of data do we need to build out that's specific to the infrastructure? This is where it becomes really interesting. Because I've been hammering on standardization and saying we want a standard, but here's the one place we actually didn't keep to a standard, between clouds. So that's actually an important point to make. Um, there's between clouds and there's inner cloud. And so the requirement we set for this was between clouds, the tools does not have to be the same. However, um, in a single cloud, the tool has to be the same. The method of deployment has to be the same. So, example here, the tool we use to deploy in AWS has to be the same when we deploy to any AWS region or any AWS account. However, that's not the same tool we use for Azure or for the data center. And why is this? Why did we go down this way and not stay standard? Well, it's actually a very difficult problem to solve, and there's a lot of companies trying to solve it today that says, get this one tool, install it, run it, and it's going to deploy to all the clouds. It worked great to start with, but it's really hard to update. It's really hard to keep up to the cloud specific. When cloud providers changes, the tool doesn't work any longer. And so you have all of these problems with this tool. So instead, we decided to make that rule because it just worked better, and it was just a lot simpler. So at this point, we go out, we have our input data, we run some kind of tool, and we get IaaS, right, IaaS, so infrastructure as a service. This is great, except that this is not what we quite want. We have infrastructure now, that means we actually have uh, instances running with CoreOS on it, or put your operating system in there. Uh, for us, it was CoreOS. Um, but they don't do anything, it's just IS. it's nothing more than instances. So now comes a very um, important part, the cluster data, right? So once we have 
input data, we know how to generate the infrastructure, we generate the infrastructure, then somehow we have to go lay on the data so that a cluster can actually come install. DCOS has done a great job as far as how, they've, how they install their clusters and build that out. So the Mesos cluster, the Zookeeper masters, all of it actually can be installed using packages from DCOS. So we've incorporated that and how they did it is actually within the user data section and we'll dig into that here in a section, uh, in a second. But that's the three important parts that we actually broke out that we said this is how we build multiple clouds. We have input, we have infrastructure, and we have cluster data. Okay, so here's a little bit more about digging into the tools, right? So for AWS, how can you build stuff in AWS? Well, you can log in through console. You can go clickety-click and go deploy some instances and install stuff, get it done. It doesn't really work for us. That doesn't meet any of our requirements. Um, you can also do cloud formation. I talked a little bit about that's actually what DCOS provides as a cloud formation template. Um, <coughs> but that is, that is JSON, right? There's Troposphere. This is actually a great tool. You can actually write up infrastructure in it and then compile it into a JSON file. Compiles it into CloudFormation template. So instead of dealing with CloudFormation, you can use Troposphere to build the, 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 uh, build the code and then run it to be able to generate the, the CloudFormation template. And lastly, there's Terraform. Don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but this is an awesome tool. Um, it's by Hashi, um, HashiCorp. Um, it's actually able to build out cloud infrastructure and keep state on the infrastructure that you've built out. So if you run your Terraform uh, commands, it'll actually know what your state is in the cloud, and if it's missing that state, it'll replace those states and so forth. What about Azure? What about Azure? All right, we have the portal. You can go sign into the portal and go click and click again. Not for us. We have ARM templates, pretty much the same as CloudFormation templates. They are JSON, right? Um, and then this actually came out only, uh, Microsoft actually open sourced this only two weeks ago. So um, I didn't even have this before when I originally submitted this talk, but now it's available um, and it's pretty, it's pretty valuable. It's called the um, Azure Container Service Engine. And what Azure did here is actually open source and provide to the community the tool they use to build their own uh, clusters or systems within Azure. So if you go grab the Azure, um, the Azure Container Service Engine, what you'll get is an engine plus all of the ARM templates that they use to spin up the clouds or uh, spin up the clusters in the clouds. So this is actually great because now you're able to use a tool to build, build infrastructure that generates a file. And finally, Terraform again. Great thing about Terraform is it is actually a multi-cloud tool. You can actually use it between clouds. And then there's the data center. This guy's a little bit harder, right? It's not, you can't just go run an ARM template in the data center. There's SALT. Um, don't know how many of you are familiar with SALT, but um, we use it pretty heavily. Um, you can probably put any configuration management system in here, Puppet, Chef, and the list keeps going. The idea here is use configuration management uh, to actually build out the infrastructure in the data center. Uh, there's another project called RackHD. This is an open source product, uh, project by EMC. Um, and I like to call it a light, uh, light provisioner. Um, what it does is actually does, does discovery of your physical infrastructure, does the firmware management, because now we're back in the data center, we have to do all these things again. It does your firmware management, it lays down the base OS and hands it over, perfect to what we want in this case. And then lastly, there's OpenStack, right? Um, probably most of you are familiar with that project. Um, I'm gonna quote a very good friend of mine, and he's pretty well known in the in industry. Um, he always tells me whenever we start talking about OpenStack, OpenStack's not a thing. Um, so I'm going to change a little bit of that quote and say OpenStack's not a thing unless you're a service provider or you have network segmentation needs. OpenStack's complex. It's not easy to stand up. It's not easy to operate. Its day two operations are very heavy. And so to build OpenStack, to build a pass, doesn't make sense. You're not building an IaaS then to only build a pass on top of that. Why not just build a pass in the first place? But it is a tool you can use. We also had another requirement that we set in place, which we call the output requirements. We wanted to generate something that actually has a file type format to it. Why is this? Why do we care about generating like a file type format for the clouds? Well, the idea here isn't just that infrastructure should be 
spun up by a massive team of uh, SREs, but that engineer should be able to go spin up that same infrastructure. It should be simple, standard. And so if we can give just a file in Git, then we've, we've really won a big battle. Because now, anyone can go spin up that infrastructure. So here's our selection of tools. Once again, the output is a file that's going to be stored in Git. For AWS, we're using Troposphere because it generates a cloud formation template that we can store in Git. Anyone can go grab it and do it. They don't have to know Troposphere and go build that. They can just use the output if they so want to. If they want to modify it, they can go in Troposphere and do that. For Azure, the Azure Containers Container Service Engine that I mentioned earlier generates ARM templates for us. And for the RAD, for the data center, we're using Rack HD. Same idea here. Once again, we're storing the stuff in Git. We're able to put a, a developer spin around this where operations can go, get the files, spin up the infrastructure. Okay, so if you think about where we're at right now, we started up with giving input data. Input data went to infrastructure data. Infrastructure is now stood up using some kind of file, right, that we wrote. And in that, we gave a prescriptive design of saying, this is how many load balancers I want in there. This is how many data, or how many instance I want in there. This is the VPC, so forth, so forth, so forth. What ended up there is we have a full set of infrastructure pulled out, ready to go. Core OS running on these systems, but nothing yet. There's no intelligence to the system yet. It's not a cluster, it's just a bunch of hosts running Core OS. We have to get the cluster data on there right now. Um, what you're seeing right there is actually an example of uh, the cloud config component in the user data um, that DCOS uses to stand up its part. Uh, cloud config user data is uh, for the clouds, Azure and AWS, you can use the user data to run on first boot, and you can actually run cloud config in it. Or if you're using, um, if you're using Ubuntu, you can run cloud init. What these are gonna do is pull down the packages, it just runs a set of commands. The, <coughs> excuse me. The, we can actually dig into this and go in much deeper. Because it's actually a very interesting topic on how to see um, how they build out their, their clusters using cloud init or uh, uh, cloud config. We can also use salt stack. However, that defeats another purpose. If we use salt stack, we have to have salt masters, we have to have complexity, and then a developer can't go do it. No developer is going to stand up a salt master and then run salt states to install a cluster and take hours to get it done just wants to run it and work, right? So we need to meet that. And Cloud and Nettle Cloud Config actually worked really good. We really like what DCOS did here. We actually pulled a lot of that off and started working with it. However, those that have ever worked with Cloud Config from CoreOS knows that it has limitations. There's some issues with it. Um, it's missing some functionality. And so they have a new tool that they're using, um, Ignite, um, Ignition, sorry. Um, so Ignition. Um, that meets a lot of those requirements. And so we're actually moving all our cloud config or our user data into Ignition right now. So what's the end result? What do we get when this is all done? Do you think, we, once again, through that story, we had input. Input went into infrastructure. Infrastructure stood up a cluster. And now we have this. And what you're looking at there is DCOS, right? And this looks the same for Azure, for AWS, or the data center. And it came up at pretty much the same time. So we were able to provision those clusters in multiple clouds in a standard way in multiple, um, and, and get the same output, the end result, which is a cluster, an endpoint or a platform that we can now deploy code to. So at this point, you're like, well, that's cute, right? So you can stand up clusters really fast. That's awesome. But if there's any operators in here, you're like, you know, like our own operators, which I respect very much, comes to me and like, you guys in architecture always just worry about standing stuff up. So you're like, go ahead and build, go build this out, and then just forget about day two operations, right? Operators worry about day two operations. Once this cluster's up, how does it look in day two? How does it look in day 100? How do I operate this thing? How do I scale it? How do I scale it down? How do I maintain the infrastructure, right? How do I troubleshoot this? Well, the good thing here Right, is all of this has been defined and abstracted into code. So whatever we need to do, we can do in software. When we need to add instances, if it's an agent we're adding or a meso slave, that instance can come up, discover itself, and add itself to the cluster. If we need to upgrade a cluster, we drain the workflow off of the cluster, 
when we stand up a new work, when we stand up a new cluster using software and direct that workflow to the new cluster and kill the old cluster, right? If there's a hardware machine, if there's a physical machine in the data center giving us a lot of issues, no more SSHing in and looking at driver issues and all this other junk. Just kill the machine, shoot it in the head, and bring in a new one. Right? These are cattle, these aren't pets. So we built a system around cattle, meaning day two operations becomes very much a software driven component. Okay, so with that, we now have the ability to spin up multiple clusters in multiple clouds, and you're thinking, well, that's fine, but how do you actually, you're saying that you can kill a cluster and stand up another one, right? How does that actually work across multiple clouds? How can you do this if those clouds are segmented? And they're not. So one of the main projects that our networking team has been working on for the last year is called MCT, Multi-Cloud Transport. And this is a huge, it's been a huge effort um, and also some awesome work done by that team to be able to um, unify all these clouds. So there's actually an underlay we introduce in all the clouds, when I say all the clouds, Azure, AWS, and the data center, to be able to talk seamlessly to each other from a networking components perspective. So if you have an instance in AWS or a container and running in AWS, and that container needs to have access to the data center, the traffic is actually gonna go through a private, through private network and will go over private IP space and be able to talk seamlessly. So this is a big step for us because that really, with this component, we can now spin up clusters, right? We have to break down a cluster and say there's not enough hardware in the data center to do that. We have to upgrade a cluster and we're saying, well, just spin up another cluster and there's just not enough hardware. We can go out and spin up another cluster in AWS or Azure for the time being, upgrade the hardware stack in the data center and then move the traffic back because we have seamless network, network traffic capability. Okay, so that pretty much tells you a story of what multi-cloud is from Adobe's perspective. Um, one thing I want to do a little bit is dive a little bit deeper into private cloud or the data center. Um, I kind of skipped over it earlier by just saying, oh, we just use Rack HD and it finds devices and then from those devices the cloud gets built and it's all wonderful and everything works. However, the data center is more difficult, right? Anyone's worked in a physical data center Work with the teams working at scale, it's complex and it's hard. Um, infrastructure as code is really hard to achieve. Or like I mentioned earlier, it's not easy just to go run OpenStack. Um, however, one of the things about the data center is because it has so much complexity, it also provides us a lot of flexibility. We can make a lot more choices in a data center than we can in AWS or Azure. Yes, we can go choose our CPUs that is tuned for this workload. We can go create a network that works a lot better um, for, for the workload than in, in a public cloud. Also, because there's no, because of what the software provides us here from a resiliency and a availability component, those components have now been abstracted into Mesos and the higher layers above. We don't have to worry about machines as much as we did in the past. Um, network storage and compute drastically changes in the data center because of this new world. Um, another important lesson we learned, power and cooling is pretty important in the initial design. If there's anything you're doing when you're standing up a data center, thinking about those two things more than anything else. Because if there's anything you want to future-proof is those. Right? You won't want to go and say, oh, hey, um, standard, we were only building out the data center, we only had 7.5 kW per rack. And then it ends up saying, whoa, but that was the old VMware environment. And that's not what we're doing anymore. I'm running now, I'm rolling in a rack, and there's 41 U's in there, and I need 17.5 kW per rack. And data center ops just looks at you, and they're like, no, it's not gonna happen. And so, being able to make sure that you're future-proofing power and cooling for the future, and so these are the hardest pieces to change when you design data centers. Um, and then new designs for new data centers, right? Mesos has introduced a piece to us that simplifies hardware and abstracts all of those pieces out. What we can now do with the underlying hardware is fundamentally different. And because of that, we need to think about moving away from old designs and moving into new designs. Some of my favorite reading that I do is uh, the work that the Facebook guys are doing in their data centers. 
they've done an amazing job of making that transition into new data center architecture. So part of our multi-cloud strategy is redesigning how we are running the data center. We call this project Greenfield, and what it is is we reevaluated compute, we reevaluated storage and network and said, based on container or containerized workflows, how do we run our run in the data center? Compute fundamentally changes. We can now run white box machines. We don't need to go run expensive machines with two power supplies and a rate controller and a bunch of sensors that needs to be booted and takes, you know, takes 10 or 15 minutes to boot up the machine because it's checking and making sure that machine is 100% right. None of that is required anymore because that machine now is a cow, not a pig. Um, it makes it simple, right? We have simple, uh, more simple infrastructure. Um, storage. Storage now is abstracted into the software. We can run HDFS, we can run something like Scale.io, um, you know, and we are able to aggregate and move the storage into software, and it's not concerned about the hardware. And because of that, now the hardware itself can just be those same machines. This is great, because what this enables us to do is collapse our models down, so collapse our infrastructure down. Instead of running a, um, a storage array over here with sand fabric, and over here, network gear with servers and all of trying to tie it all together and having blade chassis switches and dealing with all of that complexity and just throw all of that away and say that one node, it's a storage node, it's a compute node, it does all of the things, it does storage and compute. And the network. Um, actually, one of these pictures that you see right here is the close architecture from Facebook. Um, but network can go to close, uh, can, uh, needs to have a good close architecture. East West becomes very important, being able to uh, traverse traffic between machines, critical if you're saying the storage now is between all of these machines. Uh, some of the other stuff, um, pulling in a layer three BGP down to the host, instead of running it, running layer two stuff in the network, uh, using projects like Calico to provide security um, and compliance from a con container level. Um, and this is one of my favorite topics, um, to debate about is running Linux on the switch. Because we can now, um, but should we, right? And the answer is yes, because Linux is an awesome operating system, especially on the switch. We're able to get years and years of maturity on monitoring, provisioning, and we can pull it into the data center that's been most lacking that component. Right? Now the switches become cattle and not pets. No longer does a network engineer need to log into a switch anymore to be able to do work on that switch. And in fact, that should be a sin. A network engineer should be submitting code up to the repo that then updates the switches, right? Repos update the switches, not engineers. Hey, so that tells you a little bit about the whole story there. Um, I threw this one in. This is not something we're doing today but I did want to do a call out for it because I thought it is, it's, it's a really awesome project. As I was digging down, as we were doing the data center design, one of the, one of the problems we came up with is if we move to this new one compute model layer, so um, everything runs one type of compute model, right? That compute model, that's awesome, except for the Mesos master. We have a big problem there. Mesos master just doesn't require much to run. We're giving quite an expensive machine, relative right here, right? A lot, lot cheaper than your normal machines, but expensive because of resource usage, to the mess of masters to use for no apparent, no apparent reason other to be standardized. Yes, services on there too. They're running etcd, they're running DNS on there, they're running snap route, which is a uh, forwarder, uh, uh, layer three forwarder. Uh, so the, the topo rack switch is actually a router as well. Um, but most importantly, you can see they're running Mesos Master. This is, you know, looking at the future and the data center, this is why the data center is still relevant, this is why the data center is still important. We can modify, we can customize the data center a lot more than we can any of the other clouds. Okay. Okay, so time for a demo. Um, let me just go over the demo quickly and explain what you're seeing. Um, if I actually showed you what we do in the data center or what we do it against the clouds, so all you would see is one command line option and then the end of the cluster, just a DCOS screen. 
That doesn't make for a very interesting demo. However, it makes for an interesting system, not for a demo. So what I did is I actually took the generated JSON file from Troposphere that we actually have the input data from, from our CMDB, and loaded that into CloudFormation and AWS. So the file I'm gonna load in has been generated using Troposphere and, um, uh, and CMDB data, and now it's gonna stand up a cluster. And I'll kind of walk you through it as I go. Okay, so hopefully you can see, I know the resolution is terrible here, but um, what's going on is I'm going out and creating a stack. Okay, so I'm gonna grab that file. Now I would, could have been a developer or I could have been a production uh, SRE. Um, I grab that file and this is actually the input components, right? So usually this is generated and grabbed from CMDB automatically, but I'm just trying to show how those input components look. It's kind of like, what is the stack's name? What are the, what are the SSH keys, right? What is the, uh, what's the uh, number, of, uh, what is the number of slaves, and what's the number of masters you want in here? All of that input data, that's the data coming in, telling the cluster how to build. These are just some specifics to um, uh, CloudFormation, and we're gonna go kick it off, and CloudFormation's gonna start, and it's gonna say, go ahead and build my cluster. And usually, if we would have had to build a cluster like this in the data center, it would take, on a good day, three months. And we're done. Cluster's completed, cluster's up. I'm gonna go ahead and grab the output data now, which is just a URL to DCOS. That's DCOS CLI coming, or DCOS GUI coming up. I'm gonna go ahead and authenticate. And there you go. That could have been Azure, that could have been the data center, or AWS, same thing, doesn't matter. Looks the same everywhere, functions the same everywhere. Um, what I'm showing you here, nodes are still coming up, right? That cloud config data is loading in, the nodes are con uh, configuring. Some of the agent nodes hasn't been configured yet, so they're in an unhealthy state. And cluster itself is still in an unhealthy state, and they're done. They finished up too. So these nodes have been fully been provisioned. They're available. They're being used. You can see all services are running. Cluster is healthy to go. And right here, um, be the presentation before talked a lot about the universe. Something that I absolutely love about DCOS is the universe. I think it's a great component. Um, you know, with those packages in there, uh, you can also go ahead and create your own private universe. Um, I actually pulled down here, and I'm installing Jenkins, right? driving a package and then installing Jenkins onto the universe, from the universe onto the cluster. And you can see it's launching in DCOS, it's gonna spike the resources, and then Jenkins is not gonna start running. It looks like it's gonna be where it's ending. Okay, what else should I know? These are just a bunch of resources. Um, if there's anything interesting you found from today, from Troposphere, if you want to know more about that. Um, if you know, want to know more about the ACS engine, um, there's the GitHub for uh, SnapRow, for RackHD. All of these, this is all open source projects. Um, everybody's been, a lot of people contributing to it. Uh, awesome work done by everybody else um, on providing these tools so we can actually build multiple clouds um, uh, for Adobe. And um, I think we have some time here for Q and A. And, this, and I understand it's lunch, and you guys are probably pretty hungry. We've been sitting in here for about two hours now, so thank you. Um, I appreciate it. If there's Q and A, please go ahead. Otherwise, thank you guys. I appreciate for, I appreciate the opportunity for being here, and thanks for having me.